Sorry I talked so long last time. Uh, I've been instructed we're going to have one other, one short break in about uh, 40 minutes from now. So we're going to talk about 40 minutes, a quick break, and then uh, then we'll come back for the final, uh, the finale. Okay? Yeah. Um, I've, uh, whilst you've been uh, having having your break, I've uh, actually travelled from uh, from the Far East via New Zealand to South America. So I've hopped over a little bit because we're kind of running out of time. Um, there's one plant from New Zealand in the book. You'll have to buy the book to read that. I think there's only one left, so uh, yeah. But you can buy it on the net as well. It's quite easy. Google. Uh, you can buy it from Amazon or, or from the publishers, permanent publications in the UK. That's, that's, best. that's best for me anyway, as an author. Um, yeah, so we come to South America, and uh, unlike uh, many other parts of the world, uh, there are surprisingly few leafy, indigenous leafy vegetables in, uh, in South America. Um, on the other hand, there, there's a huge diversity of, uh, of root vegetables, um, particularly from the Andes, uh, the Andes Mountains. Uh, plants like uh, Oca, Mashua, Ulupu, um, which are all uh, beginning to be grown in, uh, in Scandinavia. Unfortunately, they're all uh, so-called uh, short-day plants, or most of the varieties are, so that uh, when we grow them in our relatively short season and harvest them at the end of September, we get almost no yield. Um, what I do is I grow them in, in large pots and I move them indoors and grow them on in on in a cool room up until Christmas and then harvest them as a special treat for Christmas. Um, anyway, um, that's just as an aside. Another one is Yakon, which is beginning to become popular. It's related to Dahlia or Gorgina. It's not Gorgina, but Gorgina is also an edible plant. If you grow that as a flower, the tubers which you harvest and plant the next year are totally edible. In fact, it came to uh, um, originally came to Europe um, before the potato did, and uh, as, a, as a food plant, not as a flower. Um, but the potato outcompeted Dahlia, or the Gorgina. Um, there is one, uh, uh, this is uh, Yakon, it actually does produce reasonably sized roots in our relatively short season. It's, uh, this is one of the ones that you could try. Um, and has the roots are, are quite uh, sweet tasting actually. Um, but there is one leaf vegetable um, which is peculiar to South America, and this is Gunera. And there's a Norwegian connection because uh, the genus Gunera was named after a bishop, Bishop Gunerus from Trondheim. Um, Unfortunately, the plant isn't hardy enough to grow in Trondheim. Um, it's one of the plants that I move in and out of the cellar every season. Um, and it's also, it can be huge. Um, can be almost three meters tall. Comes from Chile, southern Argentina. Um, grows often in shady conditions, but can also grow in completely open conditions, like here on sand dunes on the island Chiloé in Chile, which I visited some years ago. This was an area that was impacted by tsunami some years ago, devastated by tsunami, and uh, Gunera has uh, colonized this area. In fact, Darwin, when he uh, traveled on the Beagle around the world, he uh, visited this island and uh, described this plant and the fact that it was actually used for food by the, uh, by the local people. It's called Nalca in uh, Spanish name, this plant, and it's actually the, uh, the flower, the, the, sorry, the, the leaf stem, which is, which is used. If you go to indigenous markets, like the Mapuche people in uh, Chile, you'll find uh, bundles of these, uh, of these leaf stalks being sold. Also, along, just on the, on the roadside, you'll see these being sold. And uh, one of the simple ways of using them is basically to peel the outside uh, of, the, of the stalk and just eat it raw as a, as a vegetable. Often they, they dip it in salt, slightly citrus, slightly lemony tasting. Um, 
actually quite quite delicious, slightly sweet tasting as well. Um, so this is a guy I visited Chile some years ago. I was in the conference with my work, but took some days off. And this guy is showing me how to how to eat from a wild plant. Um, last autumn, I, I did a, an edibles tour of the botanical gardens in uh, at Milde in Bergen, and uh, they on, on Western Norway it is possible to grow Gunnera just about. It's they usually cover the plants in the winter to and keep the particularly to keep the, the rain off, um, so otherwise they, they tend to rot. But it is possible to grow on uh, on, on Western Norway, and. Uh, I was given permission to harvest one and uh, to let people have a, have a taste and uh, everybody that had a taste were, were really surprised that this, it actually tasted very sweet um, and sweet sour. And I did a similar thing at the Botanical Gardens in Edinburgh um, a couple of weeks after that. Okay, on to North America. Um, to say. I love my allium. I love my alliums or onions. And my, my all-time favourite alliums is uh, um, allium cerium, nodding onion, or what I call Chicago onion, because the city of Chicago, the name Chicago, in Indian language actually means <coughs> onion. Yeah. So it's the city of onions, uh, because uh, Chicago was originally built on the prairie. In Norwegian, it's called prairie luck. Uh, it, was, uh, it, it, it grew in enormous numbers on the prairie where Chicago was, was founded. Um, it's also North America's most uh, widespread geographically onion, and uh, because of that, uh, there are there are many different uh, forms, different uh, large ones, dwarf varieties. There are different color flowers, often grown uh, by particularly by um, ornamental collector types. Not that unusual in, in Norwegian garden, gardens as ornamentals. But really one of my favorite, uh, um, favorite alliums because it's uh, totally hardy. It tolerates more or less everything from uh, really dry conditions um, to really wet conditions. <coughs> um, the flowers are really beautiful, fantastic in salads, so they're edible. You can more or less eat the whole, whole plant. Um, and uh, the young shoots, I could almost, I can imagine them, I'm oh, sorry, next one, the young shoots in the springtime I could see being sold on the supermarket. It uh, grows very quickly, actually flowers from seed in, uh, in just two years in my garden. Uh, and it multiplies by, like uh, chives or Gresslerk does, by multiplying uh, vegetables so it can't really become quickly quite big. Um, it's also one of the few plants that uh, I can harvest in my garden now in the middle of the winter because the leaves stay green all winter and it uh, was important survival food in North America both for the Native Americans and the Europeans when they arrived and were, were moving, were traveling westwards in winter. Um, Yeah, I'll pop over that one. And we have Trace Cantia, um, which is also a pretty familiar garden plant in, uh, in Europe. Uh, Trace Cantia um, is, uh, was a very important uh, food plant for the, uh, for the, again, for the Native Americans. The young shoots are harvested in the springtime. Um, the first time I came across this, uh, this plant was uh, there was a YouTube video about so 10, 10 years ago um, of a 90-year-old American woman who was uh, leading a foraging trip. And she was in front of this plant here and she was saying that she'd eaten enormous amounts of this all her life. And there was this really energetic 90-year-old, so it was obviously not doing her any harm. So, uh, so uh, I started eating that one. Um, the flowers are also edible. I call it... Uh, um, Perennial borage, agaricurt, because it resembles a bit so uh, agaricurt so flowers, you know. And so excellent in, in uh, summer flowers, uh, summer salads. 
Another North American one I'm very, which I like very much is Hydrophila uh, modigliana. There's two or three different species called water leaves in North America. These are woodland plants, but they're also called Indian salad because, again, the Native Americans, this is a very, very important uh, uh, springtime vegetable for the, uh, for the Native Americans. Um, it also has, uh, it grows in very dark conditions in, in woodlands, so a very good forest garden plant. The leaves are really mild tasting, a good basis for a spring salad. Um, and the flowers are also edible and uh, rather pretty when they're flowering towards midsummer. Yeah. Yeah. Did you know that uh, Jerusalem artichoke, Yorskok, shoots are also edible, not just the tubers? Try the, try the shoots in the springtime, they're actually quite, uh, quite sweet tasting. And then we come to a plant which is uh, really a, a, an around the world plant, Dune Shevler, the genus uh, Typho, called um, Bulrush or Cattails in English. Um, you recognise it, it's quite a common plant in this area I think. You recognise it from the cigar. It grows in very damp conditions, and these brown cigar um, uh, seed stands uh, stand all winter. And uh, in North America, this uh, plant was uh, um, was known as uh, supermarket of the swamps because it provided practically all the needs of the local people that lived near these uh, swampy areas, the Native Americans. Um, it provided something like six different vegetables. It provided medicine. It provided oil from the seeds, very oil-rich seeds. It produced uh, different types of fiber, fiber from the, the leaves and also fiber from the, the fluffy seed heads. And uh, yeah, a, a really a, a fantastic plant. And um, it, where, you, where it grows, it grows in enormous amounts. So it, can, it, oh, it also has uh, two, two types of edible tuber you can harvest under the water. Very nutritious. And uh, one other amazing thing with, uh, with uh, bull rushes is that uh, throughout the world and all, uh, different species grow in practically all continents. So both in, uh, <coughs> in New Zealand, Australia, South America, in, uh, in Asia, in Europe, in North America, you have different species of this plant, all looking very similar. And in all of all continents, the tradition of using the pollen from the flowers as a as a as a, as a meal, okay, as a for making pollen cakes, is uh, has has uh, has arisen kind of independently, it seems. So throughout the world, this uh, nutri nutritious uh, pollen is formed into into cakes and uh, and used in uh, local cuisine. Um, so how to harvest it, you probably have to go out in a canoe, and, uh, and, but you can apparently quite quickly um, collect uh, quite large amounts of uh, pollen from uh, bulrushes. This is the distribution of, uh, not terribly hardy, mostly on uh, this area, eastern Norway and partly on the west coast, in two different species in Norway. So if you're gonna build a permaculture pond, this is probably the one you want in your garden, but be prepared it will take over the entire pond because it spreads vegetatively. Okay, we've come back home. Now we're in Scandinavia and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the uh, vegetables of the Sami people, the Laplanders, the northern Arctic peoples. Because uh, unlike the Norwegians who didn't like their vegetables, the, uh, the Sami people ate quite, uh, quite substantial amounts of vegetables, it seems. Um, and it was wild plants that they collected in the springtime. One of them was uh, kvarn, which they would eat both raw, kvarn or angelica, um, very hardy plant, which you can find right in the far north and in the mountains. Um, and uh, they ate different parts of the plant, and they had different names for the plant according to which, which if it was the flower stalk, had one name. Um, and the young shoots have a different name. Um, and uh, 
most of these uh, these spring harvested vegetables were were um, fermented, so the Mercosura behandled. Um, and in a, in a, if they take a, a reindeer stomach as a receptacle and they uh, push the, the leaves down into that, maybe the reindeer milk and it's fermented. And once it was fermented, they could actually store it, store that as, uh, as vegetables right the way through to the following spring. So they had access to leafy greens also in the winter. Reindeer stomach. What? Reindeer stomach was the reindeer stomach. Nordic yeah. glass. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That was a Nordic wow. glass, yeah. <laughs> And uh, in addition to that, um, Kvan or Angelica was one of the few vegetables that the, the Norwegians loved. And they would take long trips up into the mountains to harvest the, particularly the flower stems. So just before the flowering, they take the stems under the flowers and they were peeled and eaten. And they're much milder tasting than the, <coughs> the spring shoots, which are quite strong tasting. Um, but unfortunately, when they harvest the, uh, the flowering stems, often the plants would die as a result. And then they wouldn't set seed, and there would be no new plants. And over a, a long period of time, uh, a, lot, a lot of the, the wild stands, so it was unsustainably collected. And uh, <coughs> it, the um, trips into the mountains became longer and longer. Norwegians got into better and better form, I guess. <laughs> um, and uh, eventually they had to give up. Was, yeah. mm -hmm. But they uh, also cultivated it. And one very special form of angelica um, was cultivated in farms around the um, mountain village of Voss, Vossakon, which is separated from uh, the, it's the same species as uh, Fjellkon, or the mountain yeah. angelica, um, but it has almost filled um, stems, so it's very little hole in the middle, um, a solid. And in addition, they are, are milder tasting. So actually, also the leaf stems are quite tasty. So they didn't need to kill the plant to, um, to actually harvest from it. We don't know how it's uh, uh, or how it how it happened. Whether these were deliberately selected or if this was just a wild plant that they found one day um, that developed like this. But right up until, luckily, just in the last uh, 10 years, we've managed to save um, four varieties or lines of this uh, Vossicon from farms in the, in the Voss area. Um, they almost disappeared, but right at the last minute, thanks to the uh, uh, Norwegian Genetic Resource Centre and uh, private people, um, these old, or very special Norwegian vegetables were saved from, from disappearing and now is being uh, grown again and through the uh, Norwegian Seed Savers Organisation or Plant Equivalent for Growing Sarka, um, seed is now being made available to, uh, to the members. Come back to that. But throughout the world there are many other different Angelica or Con species. Slurka, for example. <coughs> I uh, did a foraging weekend on the island of Skomvar which is the furthest out into the Folkland Islands. Skomvar Fjord, it's a lighthouse there. There used to be a lighthouse garden there. The island's been, or the lighthouse buildings has, have been uh, taken over by some artists who were inspired by permaculture and want to reconstruct the uh, lighthouse gardens for growing vegetables in a kind of permaculture way. And uh, I was in the island for the first time in August and uh, practically the only vegetable that was available potentially was uh, slurka, which is Angelica sylvestris, um, wood angelica. And uh, we didn't have any choice, so we, I'd heard that it was quite strong tasting, so we didn't expect it to be brilliant, but it's certainly not poisonous. Um, so we harvested the uh, broccoli, if you like, just before the flowers open. So we found some of these and cooked them and serve them with a bit of butter and uh, um, to disguise any bitter taste. I think we had a bit of garlic as well or something. And uh, it was actually quite tasty. We were all very presently surprised you know, that we actually got a meal that day. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and there are many other um, angelica species around the world that uh, um, 
there are maybe, I don't know, 60, 80 different species of angelica in different continents, North America, Europe, um, the Himalayas, uh, and also in, in, um, in the Far East. And one of the Far Eastern species is sometimes grown as an ornamental in, in our gardens. It's Korean angelica, or Re Klan in Norwegian, <coughs> angelica gigas, which has these beautiful red stems also used uh, and fermented by the uh, Koreans in kimchi, for example. Um, another one which has become popular in recent years, mainly as a, as a, a medicinal plant, is uh, ashitaba. Um, I don't know if Andrew's here, but he, he grows a lot of these in, in, indoors in his house. That's um, Ness, quite near here. Um, Angelica keisukai originates from one small volcanic island off, off of Japan. So it's an endemic just to this island. And uh, this one uh, <coughs> we also saw in supermarkets in Japan. This is this, uh, this plant here. And also we visited a, a private house and they were actually growing it as a, as a house plant and clipping off the leaves to use as a vegetable. These plants there were apparently 10 years old, so they just kept on cutting them. Another very important plant for the, the Sami people was uh, um, Engsura, Surabla, Sorrel, um, which again was harvested in, in, in large amounts. In, uh, um, and, and this is a plant that, uh, that grows particularly well, well where there is a lot of nitrogen in the soil. So this grow, grew very well on the reindeer muck. So where they herded the reindeer, and maybe they moved to a new place, the Sami people would actually go back to the old place and harvested the sorrel. So it was kind of like a primitive gardening. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't surprise me that it probably just spread a bit of seed in the muck as well. You know? <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, very important to plant for the Sami people. But also, I think of, when I think of sorrel, I think particularly of the French. They love their French, their sorrel soup. And the, and the Russians also are very cultivate so sorrel on quite a big big scale uh, commercially for the markets. This is a French variety, the, the yellow leaved variety called Blanc de Lyon, I grew one here. And this is a red or dark leaved variety called, which I call vin sur or wine sorrel, which uh, <coughs> is particularly nice in the spring salads to have a bit of uh, a bit of colour. And. Uh, Two years ago, somebody tipped me that there was an Estonian Esland um, vegetable catalogue which uh, had seven different varieties of Russian sorrels. So of course I had to buy them all <laughs> and uh, I have a little <coughs> test field in, in my garden where I'm uh, trying to compare these different uh, sorrels. Uh, haven't quite worked out what the differences are yet, but uh, we'll see. <laughs> Um, and if you're going to grow sorrel yourself in, in your garden, it's best to grow one of these non-flowering varieties. Uh, this plant here, I've been growing in my garden for over 30 years. I got it from a local gardening club originally, so it's uh, in circulation, but, but because it never flowers, there are never seeds. So you have to start from, uh, you have to know somebody that has a plant and get a, a cutting from it. So, but don't all come to me at once, please. <laughs> Sorrel, very hardy plant. Yeah. We'll hop over turt, which is also very much used by the Sami people, but quite a bitter plant. The bitterness, I think, disappears to a certain extent in the fermentation process. So, uh, yeah. But the best part of turt is the uh, or is the uh, flower stem, which is milder. And then we have another common. Uh, garden plant in Norway, which is uh, Storklokke, or giant bellflower. Um, it's a wild plant, mainly along the western coast of Norway. Um, I, when I moved to my, garden, my present garden in 1983, my garden was full of this. It's a plant which has moved into gardens and ornamental because of these lo lovely, giant, either white or, or purple flowers. And, uh, it was all over my garden. I, I used a lot of energy to try and remove it. 
that was in the way, you know, it's everywhere. And then around 1985, I, I read uh, an article where, which told me that in the, in the uh, 16th century, farmers around Trondheim collected large amounts of the greens in the springtime for, for making soups. So this is a very old tradition which uh, actually has disappeared. And it turns out that when you, through my research <coughs> on uh, food plants around the world, the Campanula, or the Clocker familian, Campanula family, um, is one of the most used uh, families for food around the world. So both in North America, in Asia, um, in the Mediterranean countries, they all use the leaves of, uh, of these companions for food. Um, the young leaves are actually quite uh, sweet tasting, and that comes partly from the fact that the, the, the roots, which are also edible, are very sweet tasting. They contain inulin, which is the carbohydrate which uh, Jerusalem artichoke, uh, Jerusalem artichoke or Yorskog has. Good <laughs> carbohydrate for diabetics is in the root of this plant here. You can also use the flowers in uh, salads, they're totally edible, so any plant in that family could be used. And uh, one year I accidentally uh, had a bucket <coughs> on a bed and it, it was blanched and it turned out that these were really delicious, so we were even sweeter with this blanching um, uh, method. And then we've come to the Lofoten Islands, another onion, Allium victorialis, or say this note, something's called, uh, it's called victory onion in English. Um, this is an onion which again has a, a very large geographic distribution, it's found in the wild all the way from the Pyrenees to Japan and almost into Alaska. And uh, we have one large stand of it in, in Norway, which isn't natural, in uh, Vestvorg, one of the Lofoten Islands. And on this island, there are very large stands which are naturalized. This is a, uh, a couple from the Netherlands who are harvesting it from, from nature to make this uh, local Lofoten uh, Sayerslerk pesto. And uh, some uh, researchers believe that actually this, was a, this plant had uh, been introduced to the Lofoten Islands by the Vikings, who so had taken it with them from other parts of Europe where they saw it was being used uh, for food. Uh, so at the, in the middle of uh, Vestvorgoi, you have the big uh, Viking museum. So it was a big Viking settlement on, the, on, this, on this island, an important Viking settlement. Um, and they have reconstructed a, a Viking onion garden and planted Sayers Lurk, Victory Onion, there, along with two or three other onions. They don't, we don't know for sure. We, knew that they, we know that they grew onions, but we don't know which ones. So we must guess. Um, it kind of resembles, uh, as you can see, it resembles a bit uh, Ramsons, Ramsberg, yeah. um, but it's a bigger plant and the flowers are totally different. Um, you can use the whole plant up to just before the flowering stage as you would use uh, um, Ramsons. You don't use the bulbs, which are very small. Very productive, or it's, uh, it's, uh, it's happy. Um, and in uh, Vestvorgoi, you'll often see it in gardens being planted. Here we have an allay of victory onion being grown as an ornamental and, and <coughs> until a, about 10 years ago most people didn't know this was an onion they just it's, it had always been there and they just grew it as an ornamental every year they didn't realize this was a fantastic edible plant really healthy aligned with uh, garlic and ramsons and things like that and uh, when you tell them this uh, this guy here said uh, oh that's why it uh, it smells of onions when I'm uh, clipping the grass. <laughs> uh, another story from uh, the Far East. Uh, about 10 years I had seed of this plant on my, my seed list. And I was cont contacted by a, a Danish guy, Søren Holt. Um, and he explained, he, was, he, was, he searched everywhere for seed. He was looking for seed because he had uh, relations in Siberia. And in Siberia, um, this... Uh, Victory onion is a, a woodland plant, which uh, is used in a, in, a, in, a, in a very special spring fermented dish called um, shiremsha. 
and uh, it was basically fermented wild onion uh, which, with uh, yogurt or creme fraiche or something added to it. And this was real gourmet feast food, Um I sent him seed, and I, after some years, uh, this same guy he became responsible for the for um, for onions in the Danish seed saver organisation. And I became responsible for the Norwegian seed savers, and so we met naturally. He invited me home, and. Uh, to my surprise, he actually served this up to me at, at his house, um, this uh, Siberian. And he actually had some caviar on the same piece of toast, just to, just to show that it was, uh, <laughs> it was uh, really highly esteemed food. Whoops. So this is dis distribution in Norway, the Folkman Islands. There are a few places it's naturalized around border. Um, and there's one place in Havanga, in along Grandvins Elven, <coughs> where there's a, a really large stand of it right next to the river. I uh, should have taken a picture of it, brought a picture of it, because it's uh, quite impressive to see this woodland completely covered in this food right next to this river there. You know. <coughs> where is it? Grandvin, near Ulvik. Ulv Ulv And in Japan, where it also grows wild and it's traditional food, it's also cultivated nowadays in, in large, large amounts in, um, in fields. So again, in all the supermarkets I visited in Japan, we found Victory Win. 2014, I led the first uh, Victory Onion Safari <laughs> to West Volvo. Here we are, and uh, on the way on the train up to Border, I took the train up to Border, a very good internet connection, and I was looking into gardens in Vestvog using Google Street View. <laughs> <laughs> I took this uh, screen dump and made a picture of it, and uh, this is that plant. So I actually don't, don't need to go there, I can just use Google Street View and find the plants, <laughs> or find the food. Rust, again, hard, gardens full of this food, but nobody knows what it is. Yeah, we all know about ground elder, we've passed that. We love our ground elder, Skolakol, don't we? Uh, but we have a Facebook group, you can learn all about it, Skolakol and Zvenna. <laughs> because this really is a nutritious uh, sp spring vegetable that uh, we should all be eating more. Again, it won't be such, so much of a problem if we, we ate it. My own garden was completely covered with it when I moved there, by the way. And I, was, I had a project in Bulgaria two years ago, and I saw it for the first time in nature. You should have seen me, I was hopping up and down. <laughs> so if your garden was covered, could you really eat it away? No. <laughs> I'm not that good, no. <laughs> so you had to dig some up again? Yeah, I, I use various t techniques to yeah. covering and yeah. something called bastard digging, which is an <laughs> yeah. English technique, which is pretty hard work. but. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I did it over the years. <coughs> but if I give up, then probably within five years it will be covering the garden again. So. <laughs> this plant seems to be able to, yeah. Mm, mm, it's quite uh, aggressive. Okay. We have, okay, five minute break. <laughs> don't you want to go? They don't want to go. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, stretch your legs.